Okay, so today's lecture is going to be a bit different than usual. I'm actually recording the session live and leaving room for questions. And this is a live review presentation, one of the few live lectures I'll really be doing this term. And this lecture will outline the format of the exam and recap a number of the most important topics from the different units that we've had. And some of this is going to be pretty familiar because I have covered it in previous review sessions. One thing I'm hoping to do with this review session is draw a few connections between topics from the different units in the class, because this class is quite broad in scope. And I do hope that this review session helps the topic of the class feel a little bit less random and scattered. Um, and I will also be taking some time to do an overview of this week's lab, which is the Rocks of Antarctica lab, because it's it goes pretty in depth into some material that I didn't have a lot of time to cover in class. But note that the lab material will not be on the exam. We do not test you explicitly on the exams or quizzes for stuff that you learn in lab. Lab kind of reinforces lecture concepts, but if, it's, if something comes up in lab and doesn't come up in lecture, then it will not be on any of the exams. So um, the we are actually just about halfway through the course, which is kind of astounding. That always creeps up on me with the quarter system a little bit. Um, and if you're seeing this and you have missed assignments or had other issues because of COVID-19 or just other issues, then please shoot me and your TA an email as soon as you can, just so that we can start making a plan to get things back on track for you before it's too late in the course. Um, and I wanted to mention that I extended the deadline of reading assignment number one actually by one day because uh, it appeared late last night that a lot of people still hadn't submitted it at 10, so I just decided to give people one more day. So if you haven't already done that and you're watching this, please do that ASAP before tonight. Uh, there is The lab this week is due on Friday, February 5th, and it's the Rocks of Antarctica lab, and you'll want to make sure that you... Um, I'll be going through the slides that the TA has made, actually, and those slides on Gaucho Space are attached to the actual pictures of the rocks that you'll be working with. I will say that that this week's lab is a bit unfortunate in that it's always more fun and it feels more intuitive to, um, oh, I ignore that, that's a typo. That's meant to be due, that's from last term. I thank you for catching that. I'll make sure to fix that before I upload this to Gaucho Space, but that's this, this coming Friday, um, April 30th. So apologies for that mix up, but um, yes, Lab number four is due this Friday, April 30th. And again, it's one that is easier to do when you have rock samples, but the TAs have done their best to put together a presentation and a set of notes that will help you help you understand the basics of identifying rocks, which is what the lab is basically. I also wanted to mention that there's a colloquium happening on Thursday, April 29th at 2 p.m. And that's a potential extra credit opportunity. There's a visiting researcher from the Carnegie Museum talking about heavy metal pollution. So. Um, any, aside from the typo, and I do apologize for that, any questions about upcoming deadlines or anything of the sort? So as for the exam itself, um, and lots of cat pictures in here, um, it is open now and it will remain open until 11.59 PM on Sunday, May 2nd. And don't wait until the last minute to take the exam just because you have a 75 minute window to take it once you start your attempt. You get one single attempt and you don't want to be, you don't want to lose time in your attempt because you're starting it at 1130. It's 50 questions and you could probably get through 50 questions in a half hour, but you'd be rushing and wouldn't have time to check over anything. Um, so the exam format is 50 questions that are all multiple choice or true or false. They the quiz, the excuse me, the exam is set up so that you have the questions are on five pages and you can go back and review your answers to previous questions once you've finished a page while you're in the middle of your attempt still. So you can, you don't, you're not, so once you move on from one page to the next, you aren't set in stone. You haven't set your answers in stone until you have, um, until you actually submit everything at the end, until you push the submit button. And I would say there's about one, there's one true or false question per page. So it's mostly multiple choice, but um, a couple of true or false questions also. You have 75 minutes to take it. Um, and that's about as much time as you, that's as much time as you'd have to take it as in class if you were doing it as a sit down pen and paper exam. 
Now, um, it is basically going to be a long quiz. The questions on this exam are going to be very similar to the ones that you saw on lecture quiz one. And with the exception that there are no short answer questions, everything's going to be automatically graded. You're not writing anything out. Um, if you run into any issues with the internet while taking the exam, let me know right away um, because I can tell when Gaucho Space has screwed up and that's something that I can do my best to fix right away. So this exam is closed book and closed notes. So please don't be looking at the slides or your notes on them while taking this exam and don't talk to your friends. In general, I would really like people to not discuss the exam or the results of the exam at all because there will likely be a few people who end up taking the exam late just because of circumstances. And I'd like to make sure that there isn't information flowing around about the exam um, before everyone's taken it. I'm going to avoid addressing midterm exam results or anything of the sort until later next week and possibly even the week after that. But today is a review session and I basically have a slide for each overall unit of the class with key concepts and in a few cases I've and I've also added some example questions. Um, I've also put a few slides in that elaborate on an important concept that I think is worth reviewing. Um, and I will also be around for general questions afterwards if people want to ask anything without being recorded. Um, so we will not have any new lecture material until Monday, May 3rd on, um, that should be lecture 11, I realized because lecture 10 is going to be a sort of breather lecture on Wednesday. So Wednesday, I will not be releasing a new lecture that has material you could be tested on. I'll be going over the lab material one more time, making myself available for questions, and then doing a short little breather lecture during office hours. So any questions about this? So as for the exam format, the material is going to be drawn from the lectures, and that's going to be the videos as well as the slides that accompany them. Um, I recommend looking at, if you can, looking at the slides in PowerPoint because the notes that I lecture from are in the PowerPoint version and that might help give you some context and help you understand exactly what I'm talking about. The study guide has been out for a bit. It is still a good reference. It has a list of key terms from the slides and the test questions will almost entirely be based on those. And you do want to be caught up on the videos and articles that I've assigned, but don't spend a lot of time rereading them because I they are there to reinforce concepts from the lectures by and large. And I'm not going to ask you anything as specific as um, like, where is the penguin colony in March of the Penguins? Like, is it on Ross Island? I'm not gonna ask you anything that specific. I'm not gonna ask you anything that's like memorizing movie trivia or memorizing the exact findings from the articles. Um, but just make sure that if you haven't already read and seen those, you're familiar with them. Um, because there's a chance that the concepts referenced in them, like penguin breeding and the Antarctic circumpolar current and coldest temperatures on Earth are topics that are very likely to come up as test questions. Um, there won't be any, again, there won't be any short answer questions that more heavily draw on the articles or videos like there were on the quiz. That is something to keep in mind though for lecture quiz number two, because after the because after this week and after after the midterm closes, we'll start having new material again. And there will be some new articles and videos for you to watch. And those are potential subject matter for quiz number two, for the short answer questions on quiz number two. But there aren't any short answer questions for um, for the midterm. Any questions? You can probably hear this little lady making a racket in the background. She doesn't, she shouldn't, she doesn't have too much to complain about because she doesn't have a test to take. I envy her lifestyle sometimes. This is basically what we've learned in class so far. We learned about geography first, talking about the physical shape of Antarctica, important features like the Trans-Antarctic Mountains and the difference between East and West Antarctica, as well as some statistics like the fact that Antarctica is the coldest, driest, windiest, and highest continent on average. We learned about the small human presence and some of the main US research bases. 
We then talked about climate and how that relates to atmospheric and oceanic circulation and how it is atmospheric and oceanic circulation that help keep Antarctica so cold and dry. We followed up with some geology, learning about plate tectonics and how that manifests as different types of plate boundaries around Antarctica. And we then went back in time, first learning a little bit about fossils and paleontology and the science of paleontology, and then doing a bit of a highlights reel on interesting events in the geologic history of Antarctica, as well as the world, like Snowball Earth, the Antarctic coal swamps, dinosaurs of Antarctica, and the opening of gateways. And the gateways, including the, the gateways are the passages between South America and Antarctica and between Antarctica and Australia. And when they opened up and isolated Antarctica, that brought about modern day Antarctica by opening up the Antarctic circum circumpolar current. And so we went from the earth history of Antarctica into talking about the sparse terrestrial um, life that remains in Antarctica, and then had a whole had a whole lecture devoted to the marine ecology of Antarctica, since that is much more abundant and there's a bit more to go through there. And that is what we have covered so far in a nutshell. And I'll be going over each of these just I'll be going over each of these and some of the main points from each unit today. So before I start doing that, any questions? So the first lecture that will be on the midterm is lecture two on physical and human geography. And in the geography unit, we learned about how Antarctica is the coldest, driest, windiest, and highest continent, at least on average. Um, and now that you're further along in the class, you have a better idea of why that is. A lot of it is a consequence of Antarctica's latitude, the fact that Antarctica is um, at one of the poles and gets very thin spread out light because of the because of the fact that the solar radiation is hitting a curved surface and not hitting straight on as it does at the equator, um, as well as the tilt of Earth's axis, putting Antarctica in complete darkness seasonally, and how the different effects of oceanic and atmospheric circulation also conspire to keep Antarctica dry and cold. Not conspire necessarily, but, but function to keep Antarctica cold and dry. We introduced the concept of latitude and longitude and how those are used to make maps. And we then went into some important geographic features, how you have the separate east and west Antarctic ice sheets, which we will learn more about in glaciers next, um, next week, how the Transantarctic mountains divide the east and west Antarctic ice sheets, and how the Transantarctic mountains themselves are a, they're a, they're a remnant of rifting when Antarctica began to began to rift and separate from other continents. Um, the Transantarctic Mountains are a rift shoulder or a shoved up part of continental crust from one of those events. And I talked about features like the geographic South Pole, the southernmost point on Earth, and the magnetic South Pole, the, um, the southern pole for Earth's magnetic field, which is not actually usually at the same place as the South, mag as the south geographic pole. The South Magnetic Pole is presently, in fact, out over the ocean. It actually changes location over time. And again, I try have I've tried to written this, I've tried to write the slides here in a way that connects concepts. The Antarctic circumpolar current comes up throughout the course, for example, um, as do the Transantarctic Mountains. I talk about them in a geographic sense. And then later in the course, we learned a bit about the geology that created them. And finally, we learned a little bit about the human geography. You definitely want to be familiar with the three United States bases and remember where they are. We have McMurdo on Ross Island near Mount Erebus, which is the biggest settlement in all of Antarctica. Then you have Amundsen Scott, which is the South Pole base. And then you have Palmer out on the peninsula. So I've put one example question here about the various statistics of Antarctica. Example question, which of the following statements about Antarctica is false? A, Antarctica is the windiest continent on average. B, Antarctica is the driest continent on average. C, the highest point on Earth is in Antarctica. D, Antarctica is the least populous continent. E, the coldest temperature on Earth was recorded in Antarctica. And indeed, it is C, because the highest point in Antarctica, excuse me, the highest point on Earth is not in Antarctica. Antarctica is the highest continent on average because of the glaciers. 
but you have higher individual points elsewhere, such as Mount Everest in Asia. And in this case, in this case, you can rule out a couple of the other ones. We talked about Lake Vostok extensively, and that's something that comes up in one of the articles, and that's where the coldest temperature on Earth was recorded ever. And these first two, these first two are averages that I lingered on a fair bit in lecture in in lecture two. That Antarctica is windiest on average and driest on average. Um, windiest and driest in part both because of the high pressure zone where you have falling air, and also windiest in part because of the unbroken Southern Ocean, and because you have the catabatic winds um, flowing in a gradient from the center of Antarctica, which is higher, to the coasts, which are lower. And nobody lives in Antarctica, basically. Not nobody, but there's no permanent population there and just a bunch of researchers. So Antarctica is definitely the least populous continent. So that's um, so that's one example of a question I could ask about this material. Before I move on to climate, any, spe any specific questions about geography or related topics? Moving on to climate next. Oops, sorry about that. Um, in lectures three and four, we talked about the climate of Antarctica in terms of atmospheric circulation and ocean circulation. And lecture three began with a bit of intro material. We talked about solar radiation, the greenhouse effect, and the structure of the atmosphere. And when talking about the structure of the atmosphere, we managed to talk about a couple of Antarctica specific concepts, like how the ozone layer, which shields us from ultraviolet radiation, exists in the stratosphere, and how in Antarctica, the ozone layer is being destroyed by chlorinated fluorocarbons. It's being destroyed in part because those compounds accumulate in the atmosphere above Antarctica, and also because it's so cold in Antarctica, and because of the polar vortex. These The, the reactions that destroy ozone go faster when it's cold, and they also get trapped in Antarctica by the wind isolating Antarctica in the winter. We also talked about the southern lights and how those are formed in the um, in the thermosphere in basically the outermost layer of the atmosphere as a react as an interaction between charged particles and Earth's magnetic field. Another place where Earth's magnetic field comes up. And it comes up a couple times. We we talk about it a fair bit because Antarctica is very close to where the South Magnetic Pole is, and the field is weaker right at the pole itself a little bit because the magnetic lines are going straight. So there is more there's more, there's a chance for more interaction between the field and solar wind, and that's why we get the southern lights, and why we get the northern lights so close to the North Pole. And I've also mentioned the magnetic field in the context of seals and other organisms using it to navigate, including incorrectly in some cases, like how you get the seal mummies out in the, um, out up in the dry valleys. But, um, we moved into a discussion of why Antarctica is so cold, talking about how the high latitude means that sunlight reaches Antarctica less directly, the fact that Antarctica is tilted, which creates extreme seasonal differences in the amount of light that reaches Antarctica. And you want to understand how an excess of solar radiation and thus an excess of energy at the equator leads to atmospheric circulation. Now, as you're familiar with by now, hopefully, air, air circulates via convection. Convection is a method of heat transfer that involves heat moving via a substance, the hot substance rising and the cold substance falling. And that's what is happening in these atmospheric circulation cells. Um, warm air rises and then cold air falls. And it doesn't occur in a single cell where hot air rises at the equator and then goes all the way to the poles and falls there. That was what people originally thought the model was. It turned out that was too simple, and it turns out we actually have three atmospheric circulation cells that sort of bump up against each other. And overall, this still does lead to energy being transferred to the poles, not particularly effectively and not as effectively as would be the case if you just had a single unbroken loop. But atmospheric circulation does help bring some of that energy to the pole. Um, it also produces a high pressure zone at the poles because you have falling air um, and you have falling air that is also generally very dry because it is part of the polar atmospheric circulation cell. And in the polar atmospheric circulation cell, 
the air is rising around 60 degrees north or 60 degrees south. Um, and as air rises, it gets colder and cold water, excuse me, cold air can have less water vapor dissolved in it than warm air. So a lot of the water falls out as rainfall. And when the air continues on to the pole, it has lost a lot of its moisture. And when the air falls, it is falling as dry air. So that is a big reason why Antarctica is so dry because it is at a latitude that is receiving that is receiving dry air. And the reason that we have huge glaciers in Antarctica is not because we have a lot of snowfall, but because it accumulates over a very long time. Um, so you want to understand what I mean by low pressure versus high pressure. Low pressure is where air is rising, like at the equator or at 60 degrees. And high pressure is where air is falling, like Antarctica or the Arctic, either 90 degrees north or 90 degrees south, or the desert belts that you have at 30 degrees north and south. Um, Antarctica is so windy because of the high pressure as well as the dome shape of the glacier causing this gradient from the higher interior to the lower down outsides. And that produces these strong catabatic winds that blow from the center of the continent that are shown here. And we moved on to ocean circulation after that, talking about how wind causes surface ocean currents like the Antarctic circumpolar current and how Ekman transport causes for example, a wind um, blowing from the north to create a current that goes west to east around the continent. And I will have another slide on the, on the circumpolar current later in this presentation. Um, I'll also have another one on Antarctic bottom formation that I, that I want to linger on a bit. Um, but here's an example question regarding chlorinated fluorocarbons. What do chlorinated fluorocarbons do? A, they stop ultraviolet radiation. B, they lead to global warming. C, they create the aurora australis or the southern lights. D, they destroy ozone. E, they make Antarctica colder. And indeed, the answer is D. Um, they do, chlorinated fluorocarbons do relate to ultraviolet light in that they destroy ozone and ozone plays a role in stopping as much ultraviolet radiation from reaching the earth as it as would otherwise. But CFC is destroying the ozone. So um, CFCs are actually increasing the amount of ultraviolet radiation that is reaching the earth. They don't lead to global warming. Um, it's sort of a separate problem from that. They're not greenhouse gases. Um, they don't have anything to do with the Southern Lights. They're in a different layer of the atmosphere. Um, and they don't inherently play a role in making Antarctica colder. So um, that's that's a potential question about the ozone layer that could come up. I have a okay. quick review of the Coriolis effect on the next slide, but um, I'll go ahead and take your question. Didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> um, just had a quick question. Um, isn't like, could, could you technically say that the destruction of the ozone is part of what has led to global warming? Mm, it hasn't really, because ultraviolet radiation reaching Earth is kind of a separate problem, really. Mm -hmm. Like... Like, doesn't, does the hole in the ozone kind of make that worse, or are they just, like, not? No, not particularly. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Other questions before I move on? Because I can guarantee you that there will be something about the Coriolis effect somewhere. Um, the I wanted to briefly reiterate what is actually going on with the Coriolis effect. And you want to think about the fact that the different latitudes of Earth are spinning at different speeds. The equator is spinning faster than the poles. And we, as we're, as we're standing or sitting on Earth, we are spinning at, at the speed of whatever latitude that we're at. Um, so if you're on the equator, you are spinning with the equator. The Coriolis effect comes into play when you have a, when you have something traveling across when you have something traveling north or south so that you are traveling to a different latitude fast enough. And 
the what happens with the Coriolis effect is that when something like an airplane takes off or a projectile is launched or an air mass or water mass starts to move, the air mass or airplane will behave as if it is still spinning at the speed of the latitude from which it took off from. So the key thing is that the projectile retains the spinning velocity of the land it took off from. And for example, if you fly towards the North Pole from the equator, you will be deflected to the east. Um, and that is your right. You're in the Northern Hemisphere as you're doing this, as you are, as you are shooting a projectile from the equator towards the North Pole. What's happening is that as the projectile is moving north, the latitudes underneath it are progressively moving at slower and slower and slower speeds in regards to the spinning velocity as you get closer and closer to the pole. But the projectile is still spinning east as if it were still going at the same speed it had when it started, aka the speed you get at the equator. And so it ends up overcompensating. It ends up being deflected to the right of its original path. Now, if he were instead to head from the North Pole towards the equator, you are at quite a slow spinning velocity when you start. The poles do not spin very fast. However, as you head towards the equator, you are going to be flying over latitudes that are spinning progressively and progressively faster. But unless you, unless you are flying a plane and you correct for this, you will end up being deflected towards the west. You are not spinning fast enough, essentially, and you end up um, you end up farther west than you mean to, and that is to the right of your intended direction. That is, from, from the viewpoint of, say, you in the plane, if it's you flying a plane, you have been deflected to the right of the path you intended to take. In this example, the path is a straight line from the northern hemisphere to the equator, but you've instead been deflected a bit to the west, and that is to the right relative to your original direction, to the original direction you are facing. And remember with the Coriolis effect, be careful with mixing up right and left, which are relative descriptors in that you have to define what viewpoint it is right or left from versus compass directions, which are absolute, north, south, east, and west. The, th the reason why the Coriolis deflection is in a different direction in the Southern Hemisphere is because Earth is rotating from west to east no matter what. So in the Southern Hemisphere, you notice that if you if you are heading from the equator towards the South Pole, as you head towards the South Pole, you are flying over latitudes that are that are spinning progressively slower and slower as you get closer to the South Pole. Um, you still basically think that you are spinning at the rate that you were at the equator, and so you end up getting you end up getting pulled in the direction of Earth's rotation. And that is to the west, but now relative to your original direction, that is to the left. If you are heading from the equator to the South Pole, the direction in which you are pulled in is left relative to the original direction you were heading and the direction you're facing. And if you head from the South Pole to the equator, you again end up undercompensating. You end up you end up a lot farther to the west than you intend to, and that is to the left of your intended direction. So the Coriolis effect causes deflection to the right in the northern hemisphere, regardless of whether you're going towards the pole or going towards the equator. In the southern hemisphere, that deflection happens to the left. Again, regardless of whether you're going towards the pole or towards the equator. It depends on what semester, what, excuse me, not what semester, what hemisphere you're in. So any questions about the Coriolis effect? Moving on to Antarctic bottom water, I wanted to include a short summary of it here. It is involved in thermohaline circulation, which is the type of ocean circulation that, evol that involves 
water masses traveling between the surface and the depths um, and is largely driven by density differences. And these density differences are related to differences in temperature and in salinity, how salty the ocean is. And at the poles, um, in the ocean, there is a density barrier between the upper parts of the ocean, which are more effectively heated by the sun. So they're warmer and also saltier because the liquid water evaporates and the salt doesn't go with the water vapor. It stays behind in whatever water is left over. So the surface of the ocean as a whole tends to be pretty salty compared to the deep ocean. And in most of the world, there is a pronounced density difference between the uppermost layer of the water which in which the sunlight um, rays reach the water and the deeper ocean. And that normally prevents much in the way of mixing or in allowing water masses to travel across the picnicline. And remember that you do have distinct bodies of water in the ocean. Even though all the water in the ocean is connected, you do have distinct masses of water that have specific density and temperature um, characteristics and that can be detected even far away from their zone of formation on account of those characteristics. And one of those is Antarctic bottom water. And Antarctic bottom water is so important because it plays a role in spreading nutrients um, and oxygen throughout the world's oceans. And I mentioned nutrients because remember how um, in the marine ecology slides, I talked about how there, the, the water around Antarctica has a lot of nutrients in it. For one thing, in the, in the winter, you will get these, you will get nutrients just accumulating because there aren't any, there isn't any photosynthesis going on to use them up. You don't have much biological productivity. Antarctic bottom water does occur over the winter though. Um, and Antarctic bottom water formation helps transport those nutrients from the surface into the deep ocean and helps spread them throughout the world's oceans as Antarctic bottom water spreads towards the equator. And it also brings oxygen to the lower oceans because the Antarctic bottom water at the surface has been in contact with the air up until the point where it gets where it gets brought under. And so that helps bring oxygen to the lower levels of the ocean where marine organisms can then use it because all life on earth, except for some extremophiles does need oxygen to perform cell respiration to, to obtain energy from food. But anyhow, the density separation factors in, in Antarctica because the ocean as a whole has, is less stratified or less divided into layers than it would be at the equator especially, but really throughout most of the world's oceans. The weak sunlight that I've referred to before as contributing to Antarctica being cold also plays a role in the surface of the Antarctic Ocean being less salty than its equivalent um, around the equator. So the surface water isn't that salty overall to begin with. And it also is relatively cool. So there's not much of a temperature difference between the surface water and the deep water. And there's not that much of a salinity difference between the surface water and the deep water. Now, what happens with Antarctic bottom water is that even though the Southern Ocean as a whole is not all that salty, you do get specific zones of very salty water forming from sea ice formation. And Antarctic bottom water forms as the it forms as a catabatic wind um, blows sea ice away from the shore, and that causes water to upwell to replace the water and the sea ice that's been blown out. And that water very quickly releases its heat to the air and starts to freeze. And when more sea ice forms, there's again an instance of the salt staying in the liquid water, but not going with the water when it changes phase. The salt in seawater does not go into any of the sea ice that forms on the surface of that seawater. What happens is that 
in the area where Antarctic bottom water is forming. And it does occur on a pretty localized scale. It occurs in individual bays along the Antarctic coast. Um, in the place where Antarctic bottom water is forming, the sea ice formation will cause there to be a smaller amount of water, but with the same amount of salt. And the small localized mass of water then will sink and it can sink below the density barrier because there isn't really much of a density barrier. The water at the surface and the water below are about the same density and those are both less dense than the newly formed Antarctic bottom water. So the Antarctic bottom water just sinks right to the bottom of the ocean and it will start to spread northward. And what will happen as it starts to spread northward is it'll start reaching latitudes where there is more of a density separation and it can't just completely rise to the surface again. So it spreads out, it does what's, un, what's known as deep spreading throughout the world's oceans. And the thing to remember again is that an Arctic bottom water formation is very localized. The, there's less of a density separation in the Southern Ocean overall, but you do get a distinctly dense mass of water forming in specific spots um, on the coast of Antarctica, and that sinks down into the deep ocean. So before I move on into geology, any questions about climate or bottom water or the Coriolis effect that I might've missed? And as for the Coriolis effect, I would say that Angelina asked, can you think of it as a mirror image or not? And I, I think that's a good way to think of it actually, because the, the, the earth is basically symmetrical around the equator. And you have to remember that in either the Northern or Southern hemisphere, the earth is still spinning in the same direction. That is, that is what that is what causes there to be this difference in deflection because it's spinning in the same direction no matter what. But as you move away from the equator on both sides, you get you get you get two latitudes that are spinning less and less fast. So yeah, a mirror image is a good way to think about it. Any other questions before I before I carry on? Okay, and I do have an example question for this, but it's on the next slide. So moving on from climate, we talked a little bit about the structure of the Earth and how it's made of different tectonic plates made of rigid lithosphere. We went over how fossils and the shapes of continents and evidence of glaciers and mountain belts indicated that the continents had moved and how eventually the discovery of seafloor spreading in which new crust is produced and subduction in which oceanic crust is recycled, those allowed for a mechanism to be discovered for how the continents were moving and for the theory of plate tectonics to be developed. We talked a bit about how you have a cycle of ridge push, you have less dense oceanic crust near the spreading center itself and then more dense colder oceanic crust farther away that sinks down into the lithosphere more and that causes a bit of a gradient and that slope causes ridge push. And then you also have the slab itself that is going down at the subduction zone, pulling on the plate behind it because you get dense minerals forming in the subduction zone. And that's one example of metamorphism actually. You get one, you, one, one example of metamorphic rock formation when you have heat or pressure or both changing the texture and mineral composition of a rock so that it's a completely different rock. That happens at subduction zones and it plays a role in driving plate tectonics in the form of slab pull. And then you also have convection in the mantle like air and water. The mantle material, which is technically solid but can flow, cycles so that higher so that hotter mantle material rises and cooler mantle material falls and that and warm mantle material rising seems to play a pretty strong role in where spreading centers develop where spreading centers like the ones that successfully rifted apart the atlantic the continents on either side of the atlantic ocean as well as those that rifted apart gondwana as well as some less successful spreading centers like the one that opened up in death valley but didn't form into a whole ocean. 
those spreading centers seem to form where they are because of warm mantle material rising. And warm mantle material rising plays a role in helping the and helping the plates and helping the plates move and driving the and driving the cycle of plate tectonics. Um, and then we moved on to talking about the three different plate boundary types, divergent, convergent, and transform boundaries, as well as a few other interesting features like hotspots where you have volcanoes erupting very far from plate boundaries and fracture zones or the sort of dead transform faults sticking out from them on either side because most transform faults occur at, at mid-ocean ridges. So, um, if you'd like to access these animations, they are actually found, um, they're found on a website that I've linked under course resources. They also have some other cool animations there showing glaciation and showing some other specific plate boundary types, but this is the mid-ocean ridge. Um, oops. And the example question here is, which of the three types of plate boundaries is not present in this diagram? Divergent plate boundaries, convergent plate boundaries, transform plate boundaries, fracture zones, or spreading centers. And it is indeed B, because there is no convergent plate boundary here. You have divergent plate boundaries at, these, at the spreading centers themselves, and notice spreading center is, that's, it's, that's a type of plate boundary itself. I just put that in here to test, sort of test whether you realized what these were, but yes. Um, the divergent plate boundaries are present where the crust is coming apart and where magma is welling up in the middle. The transform plate boundaries are present where you have these connector segments between the different um, the different fissures, where you have um, there we go, where you have the crust moving in opposite directions. And we do actually have fracture zones, even though those are not technically a type of plate boundary here. So. They're not a good answer because A, they're not a plate boundary. B, they are actually present here. They are these bits away from this from the mid-ocean ridge itself, where on either side of them the crust is moving in the same direction. And fracture zones are fracture zones are basically where transform faulting has occurred at some point. Like the you've had like you have this transform fault could get wider potentially. It could go so that this spreading center moves over here and this spreading center moves over here and this, this segment between them gets wider um, and that would eat up some of the fracture zone. But right now that fracture zone is not where any plate movement is happening. Um, and so overall, so this is, this is one of the mid-ocean ridges. This is one of the underwater features that helped um, solidify the understanding of plate tectonics once we knew that new oceanic crust was being produced at these spreading centers. Um, and the thing about the mid-ocean ridges, remember, is that they are responsible for the breakup of Pangaea. They're responsible for making the Transantarctic Mountains um, when the continental crust was shoved up on either side as new, more dense oceanic crust was spread out in the middle. Um, and I do like this diagram a lot because this, this shows you that you have upwelling mantle material here. You have upwelling mantle material melting and forming new oceanic crust and over geologic time, pushing the continents to the side. And something I didn't, something I don't, didn't get a lot of time to linger on is that there is, there is a cycle of supercontinent formation and supercontinent coming apart, known as the Wilson cycle. And it appears to have a lot to do with the patterns of, of convection in the mantle, how much upwelling of hot material is occurring or whether there's more subduction and more, more downwelling of cold mantle material, because more subduction means that more oceanic crust is lost and the continents get closer together. Um, and I also like this diagram because I also like this animation because it shows how balancing of subduction and seafloor spreading keeps the earth about the same size. When scientists discovered mid-ocean ridges, they had to, one of their big questions was, is the earth just getting bigger all the time because we have new crust forming? And the answer is no. Um, oceanic crust does disappear or get recycled at these subduction zones. Um, now, a close up, I also have a close up on the subduction zones here. And 
I like this animation because it, it might help you visualize some of the differences between different types of igneous rocks or rocks that come from magma, which is something that comes up in this week's lab. A lot of volcanoes occur at subduction zones. Um, and actually, continental crust, which is lighter and which it's lighter in color and less dense and thicker than the crust that gets made at mid ocean ridges, that is to a large extent formed by subduction, where you have a downgoing oceanic plate um, underneath either a plate made of continental crust or oceanic crust. Um, and what happens is that the subducting plate is actually causing this part of the mantle to melt. It's not causing very, it's not bringing the temperature up very much. The downgoing plate is actually, you'll notice it's dragging sediments with it. And those ocean sediments have minerals in them that have water in their chemical formula. And as they get dragged down, the water gets released into the mantle. Water being released into the mantle helps lower the melting point of the mantle. The mantle is actually mostly solid, which is something that's hard to conceptualize sometimes, but this is actually solid mantle that's being melted and that produces magma. Magma that is usually of a lighter color than the magma at the ocean spreading centers. Um, the reason why that is, is that the lighter colored minerals melt at lower temperatures. So you need higher temperatures to melt um, to melt the mantle so that you get a lot of mafic minerals, darker colored minerals in them. And that's that happens a little bit more at the spreading centers. But subduction produces continents. And one thing we talked about in the Earth History unit was how um, mountain building events evol involved, um, involved for subduction in which you had ocean plates being subducted and generating these island arcs. And then the plates would be, the bits of continental crust would be would collide into each other um, as mountain building events as orogenies. And it's not shown in this diagram, but if you have two plates that both have continental crust, they neither of them will subduct. You will get uplift and mountain building instead. So not all convergent plate boundaries involve subduction. Um, if there's two plates made of continental crust, you will get continental collision and mountain building instead. But as long as you have at least one oceanic plate, one of them will go under and cause melting and cause subduction and this arc of volcanoes. So any questions about plate boundary types? And those animations are also present in the slides for the respective lectures, if you'd like to go back to those. Now, the Earth history was kind of like a highlights reel. We started with a summary of fossils and paleontology, and you learned about relative versus absolute dating, as well as how important fossils are for studying the rock record, and how you can either have body fossils that are of the organism itself, or trace fossils that are a remnant of something that the organism did. And we went from the formation of the East Antarctic Craton via subduction and mountain building to the Great Oxidation Event and the presence of cyanobacteria to Snowball Earth onto the Cambrian Explosion and the appearance of most modern groups of animals before we jumped forward quite a bit, millions of years later to the Carboniferous period shortly after land was first colonized when Antarctica was covered by warm swamps that produced the coal that we find there today and coal that and similar swamps that were some of the first land ecosystems that existed. The ocean was where life originated and it took time for life to evolve the ability to survive on the land. And some of the first widespread forests which covered most of the continents were the swamps in the Carboniferous that because there was so much biological activity and so much material piling on top of itself that buried the older organic matter before it could completely decompose and made coal, including in Antarctica. 
The Carboniferous period was followed by the colder Permian period in which Antarctica had glaciers for the first time since Snowball Earth and for the last time until the current ice age, which began with the opening of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current much, much later in the age of mammals. Sort of appropriately, in the Permian period when Antarctica had glaciers, the main land animals were not dinosaurs yet, but they were the synapsids, which were the ancestors of today's modern mammals. And the synapsids were decimated by the Permian extinction, which was caused by volcanic eruptions and ocean acidification, um, which also devastated marine life, wiping out 96% of it or so. And in general, in general, opening up a lot of new ecological niches, both on land and in the ocean. And not all synapsids went extinct. They would evolve into true mammals near the end of the Triassic period, which was a much warmer period in geologic time. And it's the first of three periods known as the age of dinosaurs or collectively grouped together into the Mesozoic era. And by the way, I'm not going to be testing you on what the difference between a period and an era is or asking you really specific questions about different intervals in geologic time. But for the ones I lingered on, it's good to know why I lingered on them. The Carboniferous is when you get coal swamps. The Permian is when you get glaciers and mammal ancestors. Um, and then you, have, then you have the age of dinosaurs. So you wanna be familiar with, if, if something on the, on the study guide, you wanna be familiar with why I lingered on it, but I'm not gonna ask you to put them in order on a chart or tell me what the difference between an eon and an epoch is. Um, even though those are things I've referenced briefly in the slides, I didn't really put them on the study guide for that reason. So dinosaurs evolved near the end of the Triassic. And by that point, Earth is a lot warmer. The glaciers are all gone. And Earth, Earth's continents have fused into Pangaea once again. Um, the Pangaea was not the first supercontinent or accumulation of all the continents. It was the it was the second that we've studied. The first was Rodinia, which was before the Cambrian period, much before that. So supercontinents form pretty far apart. A supercontinent exists for maybe a few million years, and then it will start to come up, or for a few tens of millions of years, and then it will start to come apart again. Um, but eventually the patterns of circulation in the mantle or the Wilson cycle will start to bring the continents again. So Today, the continents are quite spread apart, but it's very probable that eventually the continents will start to come together again, that the Atlantic Ocean will reach its maximum extent, and then you will start to get some, you'll start to get new subduction zones forming on either side of the Atlantic. But that is looking forward. That's not something you need to worry about for this exam. It's just sort of a tidbit to think about how Earth's surface is still dynamic, and we still have the locations of plate boundaries changing and where the plate boundaries are today is not necessarily where they will be in 10 million years because um, plate boundary locations change. But anyhow, dinosaurs very quickly spread across the earth and inhabited all of the continents, including Antarctica. And we do have a few dinosaur fossils from the Jurassic onwards um, that show us that even though we don't have a lot of fossils left because Antarctica's rocks are largely covered by glaciers, there was still a diverse variety of dinosaurs and there are a lot of the same varieties that appear elsewhere in the world show up there because the continents were still all connected. Um, so we talked a bit about the unique polar community of dinosaurs that existed close to the South Pole in the Cretaceous when the climate was really warm and when dinosaurs adapted to the polar darkness by either migrating or or sort of sort of hibernating or sort of or feeding off of or feeding off of like roots and the plants that the plant bits that were still there during the cold season um, and how this has provided evidence for dinosaurs being warm blooded Dinosaurs go extinct almost entirely though, um, with the impact of a giant asteroid around 65 million years. And that leads into the age of mammals in which we still have some dinosaurs, we still have birds, which are the descendants of dinosaurs, but most of the meshes are taken over by the modern mammals, which had existed throughout the dinosaur era, but had mostly occupied little scavenger or insect eating roles that the dinosaurs wouldn't go near. 
Um, and we talked a bit about how Antarctica did have some land mammals early on in the age of mammals and how they lived alongside the ancestors of today's penguins. But with the opening of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, Antarctica became too cold for most terrestrial life. The penguins adapted to the existence, but most of the land mammals, but the land mammals did not. And today Antarctica's, Antarctica's, Antarctica has very little land biodiversity. It has very few animals that entirely live on the land and do not rely on the ocean for a food source. And that is why penguins are not considered to be land animals because penguins need the ocean to feed. So any questions about earth history before I move on to the next slide? Now I mentioned that I would have something on the Antarctic Circumpolar Current and I will say that the geometry is a bit more complicated than what I go over here, but the winds from the other oceans are going north to south and they cause, they end up, Ekman transport ends up causing the water to move in a west to east direction because of this. And because you have winds coming down from all of the oceans, you have one big southern ocean encircling Antarctica, it creates a gyre or a looped current that can flow around the entire continent. And it plays a strong role in stopping any warmer water from equatorial latitudes from reaching the Antarctic continent and possibly bringing some more warmth to the air or to the land. And the circumpolar current has been open since the Oligocene epoch, which is in the middle of the age of mammals. And it opened up when Australia finally broke off from Antarctica. Antarctica was part of Pangaea, and then even after Pangaea began to break up, most of the southern continents were still together as one sort of mini supercontinent for a while, you might call it Gondwana. Gondwana is kind of like one of the two halves of Pangaea. The other is Laurentia, which is the northern continents, and that broke up a little bit faster. Um, but Africa, South America, Australia, um, Zealandia, which is now just just New Zealand, but used to be a larger continent, and also the Indian subcontinent, which is now attached to the rest of Asia, but has a long history of being associated with the southern continents. Those were all together at one point, but they began to break up progressively. Um, and as first the connection between Antarctica and South America became more tenuous, you started to get a water flow in here, in the Drake Passage, one of those gateways. And then in the Oligocene, Antarctica finally permanently detached from Australia as the Tasman Sea began to open up due to seafloor spreading. And that allowed a current to form around Antarctica and the first Antarctic glaciers formed shortly afterwards. And as the glaciers spread across the continent, and by the way, that had something to do with Earth as a whole getting colder also, because we have an ice sheet on the North Pole that doesn't have anything to do with the circumpolar current. But the circumpolar current played a role in an ice sheet showing up. We think the we think the Antarctic ice sheet showed up before the Greenland ice sheet, and the circumpolar current has something to do with that. And Antarctica slowly became inhospitable to all besides besides some insects and some extremophile bacteria. Basically, it became just about uninhabitable. Now, I have an example question here that's to give you a sense of give you a sense of what what depth of knowledge you might need to remember. So we've talked a fair bit about different extinctions when life in Antarctica or worldwide died off all at once due to natural disasters occurring. So what caused the Permian extinction, which wiped out 96% of all marine life and reduced the population of synapsids or mammal ancestors? So that should give you a clue that that was quite a while ago. We don't really talk about synapsids in the age of mammals, we talk about just mammals. But A, volcanoes and ocean acidification. B, an asteroid. C, the opening of the ACC, D, the breakup of Pangaea, and E, the Cambrian explosion. Indeed, it is A, because the Permian extinction was caused by runaway ocean acidification when volcanoes ignited coal fields. Um, it was not caused by an asteroid, that is what wiped out the dinosaurs, and the ACC opening didn't didn't cause a mass extinction in the way that I describe it, but for Antarctica, it wiped out most of the land, it wiped out most of Antarctica's terrestrial life. The breakup of Pangaea, eh, I mean, that's sort of, that's, that doesn't have anything to do with the Permian extinction. In fact, the Pangaea was, was all together um, throughout the Permian and the Triassic. And the Cambrian explosion is not 
actually a die off of life. I, I've thrown it in a few times because it is explosion sort of makes you think destruction, but it actually means explosion in the sense of lots of life showing up, like an evolutionary radiation producing most of the groups of modern life that we have. Um, and yes, the Permian extinction is also known as the Permian Triassic extinction. That is a very good question. Um, just the same way that the Cretaceous extinction will be referred to as the Cretaceous Neogene extinction. But yes. Um, other questions? And lastly, we went on to the modern ecology of Antarctica. And terrestrial life in Antarctica largely went extinct after the ACC formed, which leaves just some tardigrades or water bears, some simple plants, and some extremophiles. But the marine food web is a lot more diverse. You have, um, you have the phytoplankton that live in the water, and those are the autotrophs, or the organisms that make their own food, and they're fed upon by krill and other organisms. They spend the algae spend the summer dormant, frozen in the sea ice or living underneath it, and that provides a winter food source for the Antarctic krill. And then in the summer, when you get 24 hour daylight, the um, that and the excess of nutrients causes this productivity boom. You get a large boom in the population of phytoplankton and subsequently the krill boom in population um, because there's now tons of food for them to eat. And you, then have crab eater seals and whales and fish feasting on the krill. And that's specifically why whales actually migrate to Antarctica because you get this big boom in the krill population after the phytoplankton population booms. You have penguins and other seals feeding on the fish. And then you have leopard seals and orcas preying on the penguins as well as the fish. A lot of the fish have, have adapted to the cold by evolving glycerol proteins or becoming really large. And the large size is also something that you see with a lot of Antarctica's benthic organisms or the bottom dwelling organisms. Marine mammals largely stay warm while swimming by using blubber. Penguins stay warm through a combination of behavioral adaptations like huddling and using a tripod stance, as well as physical adaptations like their streamlined feathers and subcutaneous fat. And um, indeed, Angelina, um, the question is, do crab eater seals actually eat crabs? And they don't eat, they don't necessarily eat like large crabs, but they eat krill. They're referred to as crab eater seals because they eat krill, which are not quite crabs, but they're in the same family as them. Krill, if you remember the pictures from the slides, look like little shrimp. So crab eater seals are adapted to eat, adapted to eat krill, yes. Um, and the, we talked about some feature, we talked about some cool evolutionary adaptations within Arctic marine life, like how whales have adapted growing hair in their mouths, essentially baleen to filter krill and take advantage of that food source and how some types of seals like the Weddell seal will use echolocation or magnetic compasses to navigate and how they'll, they've evolved to dive deep by having a lot of hemoglobin in their blood and that helping their bloodstream function as a scuba tank basically as having as letting them have a lot more oxygen in their system than they otherwise would have. Um, and that is about all we learned that is about a summary of what we've learned so far in the course. Um, so any questions before I start to move into the lab review. Cool. I am going to pause recording just so that I can split this up. So I will see you in the next recording of the lab review.